Welcome to this morning's live webinar event in conversation with Mr. Gopichand P. Hinduja. My name is Andy Lockett and I'm the Dean of Warwick Business School. I'm delighted that you've been able, that you've been asked, to, and so I've been delighted to have been asked to step in for the Vice Chancellor Stuart Croft, who unfortunately is unavailable this morning and to host this conversation with Mr. Hinduja. Thank you all for joining us this morning. Our audience today is a mix of alumni, staff, students and friends from across the world. Thanks to those of you who have sub submitted your questions in advance, which we have been used to guide our conversation today. We will aim to take some live questions from the audience at the end of our discussion, time permitting, so please use the Q&A function to submit your questions. We have some colleagues on hand from our enterprise and innovation team to help signpost our resources if required. So now to our speaker today. Fondly known as GP in business circles, Gopi Chand is one of the most successful business leaders in both the UK and India. With decades of experience, intelligent investment and disciplined growth, GP and his brothers, Sri Chand, Prakash and Ashok have masterminded the group's transformation from an Indo-Middle East trading operation into a multi-billion dollar privately owned transnational conglomerate. The group today operates in 100 countries with over 150,000 employees, working across 11 business sectors, encompassing automotive, energy and renewables, banking, IT, power generation, real estate, project development, media, healthcare, trading, and most recently, cybersecurity. GP, it's a pleasure to meet you this morning. Thank you for inviting me and giving me this opportunity to talk about my experiences. I am uneducated and not a professional at all. And I started my life with a lot of difficulties and challenges. And that is what really made me successful. And I am always of the view that whenever there are difficulties and challenges, if you have faith in yourself, if you have courage in yourself, you can always be successful. I don't know, from the very young age, I always used to believe next to impossible is only possible. <laughs> but you have to have confidence, courage, and faith in yourself. And you should not have any vengeance to anyone. And you have to try and see how one can help the society. And life and death is definitely there. The certainty of death is also there. So many a times I get really shocked when people become rich, they are arrogant. They think they are most happy and successful people. Whereas I believe totally differently. Because in my family, nothing is owned by anyone. My father left us message Everything belongs to everyone, nothing belongs to anyone. We learned quite a lot from his principles. And uh, one of the principle was work to give. And work to give was that don't be surprised or shocked when I tell you I have no wealth but people call me a wealthy person. I get 250 pounds from my wife per week. And that also I consume for coffee with my friends with whom I walk in St. James Park. Because I believe one thing in life, that wealth is to give away for good work, and philanthropy has been the backbone of our family. 
Fortunately, Gayatri's mother, my Rita, uh, daughter Rita, morning to evening, she is only in philanthropic activities. Similarly, all our second generation, third generation, they always look what it was. Because my late father always used to say that health and education is the real right of every human being. And in those days, I remember it was so difficult even for students to pay their fees in kindergarten and high schools. So he had started schools, colleges, hospitals on non-profit making basis. And whatever he did, one incident I can never forget, when he, whatever good he used to do, he never wanted his name to be on it. He never wanted to talk about it. He used to say, do good and forget. In Hindi, we call it Neki Kar Kuemendal. Do good and throw it in the well. But after his death, a Swedish consultant came to the brothers and he said that, look, to inspire and encourage others, you should put your father's name on institutions what he created. That is how, after his death, we went and named the hospital after our father, the college after our father, and many other institutions. And the most ambitious uh, institution now we are developing is World Knowledge Center where I have put many experts together to have brainstorming what this World Knowledge Center should provide, which is not there anywhere. And for that, I would really love to see if Warwick University can also provide their thoughts and ideas. We have a land bank of over one and a half billion pounds, which we have given it for this purpose. Now, many ideas have come from different consultants, different professionals. Some say go in health, some say go in education, some say just have scientists. So we are at the stage of uh, working what will be good for the world. Now, in this way, we have done a number of things which keep on happening and we always keep our eyes and ears open for opportunities to come. So, many a times, I start thinking why we should do this. But then it reminds me of my late father. He always said, work to give. And that always gave us happiness. The rest of the happiness are temporary. And if I look now, I have about 150,000 employees globally around the world. Now they are all professionals. They are 10 times more educated than myself. How to control them? How to look, make sure of the risk management? Because professionalism and entrepreneurship, no doubt it goes hand in hand. But if you look at entrepreneurship, you have big names, whomever you see who didn't have entrepreneurship, the professionals just go by the book process, by the book. Whereas an entrepreneur will think ahead of time. He will have instincts. He will say, okay, if this has happened and if it is not working, how can I turn right, left, or do what to make it a success? So Andy, 
I will leave it to you to put any type of questions you want. And my uh, supporters in the office, they prepare something and give me, and you will be surprised to see that I never get time to read them. I like to speak what comes to my mind, <laughs> what I have experienced in my life, and what comes to me. Although Michael was here, or my other people in different countries, when they come to know I have such event, they send their thoughts. But I should have time to read them. <laughs> I don't get the time to read them. And again, they write in a very professional way, which is totally different to my thinking. So many a times Michael tells me, sir, why do you need anything? Hmm? You just go on the way you like. <laughs> but still, I get it. So, Andy, I leave it to you from so, where you'd like to start. No, so, so thank you, GP. That was a um, fascinating introduction, and you've, you've covered a kind of wide range of topics we can come back to. Um, in some ways, it kind of mirrors the Hinduja group in terms of being a fascinating and vast organization. Uh, so, I wonder if, you, to begin with, you could give us a little overview of the group today so people on the call can understand a little bit more about the group, but also what your position in, in the business is today, because obviously it's a vast organization. Okay, I will start from my late father, because he was the one who really was a real entrepreneur. He, his father, means my grandfather, died when he was 14 or 15 years old. And we used to live in um, Shikarpur, Sindh, which is now in Pakistan. So my grandmother asked her brothers, who were successful business people, to take my father to Mumbai. Now Mumbai, in those days it was Bombay. And to train him up and make him learn. He went there, he worked very hard for one year with them. And the one year when he got completed, he went to their uncle and mentioned that I'm going to see my mother after one year. Can I have some compensation, some contribution from you? Because for one year I have not taken anything. So they were laughing at him. They told him, you came here to learn or to earn. He said, look, I am just wanting to take something for my mother, who is your sister, to go and give her from your contribution. But they did not give him. And my father took an oath that he is never going to be employed by anyone. He wants to be a self-employer. And he came back to meet his mother and went back to Bombay. And he used to be either on railway platforms or on the street or in friend's house because he didn't have funds. But he had a lot of stamina for hard work. He did a lot. So he started the textile business. All the big mills in India, they wanted to sell goods. He knew who are the buyers and he trusted them. And the mills also trusted them. That's how he started making money with no money. But with good reputation, honesty, integrity. Now, these are very important things in life, which helps one to grow, whether he's a professional or he is an entrepreneur. And then he found, when the World War was announced, everyone declared force major. Uh, he decided 
not to declare force majeure. And he went on the wooden bars across the Indian Ocean to Iran, south of Iran. I think he was the first Indian to be there. And he was a strict vegetarian. In those days, in Islamic countries, they hardly understood what is vegetarianism. Maximum you could get potatoes or tomatoes or brinjal, nothing more. When he landed there, he went to different customers to see if he could sell the textiles, which he had committed to the mill owners in India. When others had also declared force major. He had sent his one brother to Karachi, one brother to Afghanistan. They made a big fuss of him that he's an Indian. He will never honor his commitments. And whatever commitments the buyers do with him, they will never get the goods. So my father found it difficult, but he told all of them, fine, I'll get you the goods. Once I give you the goods, then you pay me. And he started selling goods at half the price. Half the price of what the competitors were selling. Because they were selling at 400%, 500% profit. In those days, system was difficult. And all the competitors came to him to join the cartel. He said, nothing doing. I'm very happy on one rupee, if I'm making four rupees, three rupees, I'm more than happy. So in this way, not only he consumed all his textiles, but even the textiles which were not picked up by the other buyers in India, he did it. So he started with textiles, tea, jute goods, and he always believed in one thing. When I was 17 years old, I was in college. I was in my second year and he told me, my dear son, education is good, but you have basic education. I used to attend the college from seven in the morning to 11. From 11, I used to rush to six and 30 to eight. And you will be surprised up to the age of 47 years I never took any one holiday, not even on Saturday and Sunday. And my objective was one, that I have to be something successful, but not for myself, but to give away. And at the age of 47, one day, I was at a reception I suddenly found my head was going round. And I rushed home. The doctor came and he told him, GP, you're stupid. You don't take a break. You don't relax. And that's why all this is happening to you. So have a break. And, but still, after a day or two, I was back on the same thing. But then I found it difficult. I went to Tel Aviv. This was a professor who looked after uh, the famous uh, British Prime Minister. I'm just trying to remember his, his name. And he told me one thing, GP. If your wife is here, well and good. Otherwise, take a girlfriend, take a car, and keep on driving for 15 days. Forget the city. Come after 15 days to me, and I will check you. Because he said the break is necessary. The relaxation is necessary, and weekends you have not enjoyed. Even when I'm married, 
I went only three days before my wedding date. So we got married. And in those days, uh, it was arranged marriages. And whatever parents decide, we used to agree to it. And then the father said, you go for 10 days for a honeymoon. But I never went for honeymoon also. Because I wanted to go to meet my commitments. So hard work, commitment to work, and have a clear-cut objective helps you in life. That was my real key of success. But after my Tel Aviv visit, I used to take one day a week a holiday. And that holiday also, I loved music. I may not be a professional singer, but I loved music in those days. Lyrics used to be fine. And they were full of meaning. Whether those were Bollywood, Bollywood was created by the Hinduja brothers. Bollywood was never there. We had 1,444 movies which we produced finance. That was our side business. In my 12 verticals, you will not see it. <laughs> but, but even the Hollywood movies in those days, I remember very well. Artists like Sophia Loren, Gregory Peck, the movies like Roman Holiday, Sabrina. This is all what I liked. And I also imported Hollywood movies like World Circus, Roman Empire, and all the big ones from Italy, from everywhere. So when I start thinking, what is the business I have not done in life? Three things. One, alcohol, we have never dealt with it. Meat, we have never dealt with it. Casino, we have never dealt with it. But otherwise, we have done each and every business. Although that business never used to be expertise of ours. But because of the reputation of the father, the reputation of the family, big producers from Australia, like Broken Hill, Electrolytic Zinc, or others, whenever they came to Iran, they first used to come to our office. And they said, Mr. Hinduja, can you buy this? Now, we didn't have that big money. But they trusted us. They used to send goods to us on trust. And we used to sell. I remember they used to give us producer's price. And we used to sell with CNF extra cost and on London Metal Exchange prices. So I started thinking, why others can't do this? Others can also do it. Why shouldn't they do it? But I find it's very difficult for people to do hard work, to be committed, and to work for society. Because if you do these things, God helps you. And I have a great faith that even when there is something impossible, how it becomes possible, hmm? it's shocking for me. But once I take my decision, I have to do it, I do it. And timely, I have been leaving countries. I left Israel in time before the war broke out. I left Iran two months before revolution. I left Beirut before the war broke up. So in this way, everything was done timely. And when we came in uh, outside 
Iran after revolution, we went around the world. And we preferred United Kingdom. I preferred London. Firstly, Mrs. Thatcher had announced privatization. We have been the first one to get into privatization here. And we invested in British companies in India. And I remember Lord Young used to be the Secretary of Trade and Industry. But wherever we went, Andy, we used to follow our principles, especially on culture, traditions, whatever our family had. Even today, at my home, I have never served non-vegetarian meals. It's all vegetarian. Now, if you see, they want to become green. Vegetarianism is the basic for that, which helps. So, we kept on going in different verticals. We were the first one to acquire Leyland. We were the first one to acquire Gulf Oil. There was anything, good opportunities came. We were successful in doing it. Although that was not our sector, we never understood that sector. We were the first Indians who got the license to start the bank in Switzerland because there was no reciprocity arrangement between India and Switzerland. But because we were UK residents, the regulator in Switzerland said, if Bank of England gives you a good certificate, we will accept you. And at that time, when we approached the governor here of Bank of England, they immediately provided us. And in this way, Andy, there are many stories. I can keep on going for hours and hours. But I, I can only say a few things which can be useful for the students that prayer might not change things, but it is sure to change you. My greatest learning, nothing is impossible. Next to impossible is possible. Second is, revenge never leaves you happy. Uh, revenge never leaves you happy. It leaves you empty and embittered. Therefore, never retaliate, but forgive and forget. Whoever has the sense of forgiving and forgetting is really a great person. Then I also thought when God closes one door, he has already opened another window. To, one should not get disappointed. If things don't work, fine. If you're climbing the steps, the target what you have, and you fall, have faith in yourself. That is the climbing steps to go further up. Now, the best ornament is humility. Humility has to be there in human being. The richest wealth is wisdom. The strongest weapon is patience. The best security is faith. And the best tonic is laughter. You should have laughter. I'm glad to see Andy, you're laughing. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm, I'm smiling now. It's uh, it's fascinating from from what you you've talked about. It's um, it's so clear the the importance of the enduring values of the organisation, which was set by your father and the family, and how they've endured over time. And as you've spoken, you've spoken about many different vertical sectors, but also different countries, all of which have seen dramatic change over time. And I think over the last 
probably 24, 36 months, we've seen some quite dramatic change in the world in particular. Uh, if I think of uh, the UK, the two things we're probably more tired of talking about is Brexit and COVID more than anything else, which have dominated the news. So given the, given the past year, I'd be interested to how you and the, the Hinduja group have adapted to those challenges, because obviously these are huge global challenges, particularly COVID. You see, in past, we have seen Spanish flu, we have seen World War One, we have seen World War Two, we have seen plague, also flu when it came in. Now, these are all pandemics which keep on coming. Similarly, when this came in, people were disappointed. But if you look at the positive side of it, that how the working style has changed. Take a simple example of me. When I used to attend the office, I used to have seven or eight assistants as secretaries, as executive assistants, who practically used to do everything for me and they used to come only to take my yes or no, or any directions or anything else. But since last one year, we have been isolated. I have learned how to work with Zoom. I have learned technologically how to go. We started new 11 technology companies. So everything what goes wrong, there is something better behind it. But where I feel sorry are the people, are their family members when they die. Now, again, the strong faith I have, the death is not in anybody's hand. It is forewritten ahead of time when a human being has to go. But many countries, take an example, India, they achieved quite a lot and totally coronavirus had disappeared and the wave has again come in a big way. Now, why did this come? My belief is different because India started becoming proud that <laughs> they are they have handled it very well and they have done all this in there. And lot of freedom was given. The total fear had disappeared in India and they never bothered that they have to take care. And now we are suffering there. Even the Prime Minister Boris Johnson's visit has been put off because I was expecting that with his visit, the India-UK trade investment, India-UK relationship, political, economic will grow. Post-Brexit, UK is trying to see how they can balance it with bilateral relationships. And India, being the largest democracy in the world, but they are suffering because of bureaucracy. It's not easy to go and invest in India. It takes a lot of pains to get things implemented there. But things are happening. But I am very confident to answer your question on COVID-19. A lot has been learned by human beings and I feel next year will be a very positive year. You can see China, the first quarter growth is 18.3% GDP. Now, there is a lot which will bring good to us. We have to think positive. We should not be thinking negative. No sooner you have negativity, the vibrations 
spoil you. When you go to the temple or to the church or any spiritual place, why? Because you can even pray to God at home. When we go there, our mind is focused to get positive vibrations. And that positive vibration helps to make a progress and think well. So we should not get concerned on COVID-19. We should follow the discipline of taking care. And as in past, Spanish flu, plague, World War I, World War II, all this disappeared, things started becoming better. We will be back to normal. But there is a possibility that the style of working may because all the business people, everyone has started working from home. And they are using all these VCs, Zooms. The, what is missing is the social gatherings. That will come back. Because that also helps to have a diversification and relaxation. So to, I am confident that 2022, you will see the positive side and the, everything will rebound back to normal. So, GP, can I ask you within that, where do you see some of the new opportunities coming as a result of COVID? Because obviously the way in which we work has changed, but also fun fundamentally, do you see that potentially having an effect on markets and other forms of behaviour? You see, uh, in my view, the old economy is disappearing. Everything will be new technology, like thermal uh, power disappearing, solar coming in, renewable energies coming in. Similarly, if you look cyber security, look, I, basically technology companies, pharma companies, and even if you look at electric vehicles, hmm, you will find totally diesel and petrol disappearing. So there is a great change which will take place. I don't know, we have learned quite a lot in last one and a half year when things have gone and God has helped again, I'll tell you. Because my father used to always put and it is one of his principles. Act local, think global. Not only jurisdictionally, but even in our activities, we are diversified. And even in uh, old economy activities, we have started, for example, we were manufacturing vehicles and buses. Our younger generation came and they said three years back that the future is electric vehicles. So you'll find we have started the electric bus vehicles in Leeds in UK. And I think we are today the best in Europe. It has the best technology. Already 248 buses are on the street. These are all electric. So in this way, there are so many sectors which are coming, but they are all new which the old timers like me were never in it. But I had to prove to my youngsters that I'm still not old. So I was the first one to take the initiative in the family to go for cybersecurity because I thought that is the future. And this is how it is moving. Now, if I was highly educated, I would have gone with the process of the book. Not being educated and having seen challenges in life 
having seen difficulties in life, try to make money from no money, but with honesty and dignity and loyalty. I am able to change my mind from one sector to other, other sector to third. For me, all the countries in the world are same. I think India today has the best opportunities and could be in next 10 years, either the second largest economy or the third largest economy in the world because Indians are talented, but they were in difficulties. Today you look at Israelis, why have they become experts in technology? Because they had to suffer quite a lot after the World War. So whenever there are difficulties, challenges, believe me, this gives you a success. It gives you new thinkings, provided you're committed to it. If you're not committed, and if you say, oh, that's my bad luck. Now, what is bad luck? No doubt. I don't know, Andy, if you people understand what are sanskaras. That is character. The upbringing of the child. How does it happen? When the child is in the womb of the mother, the environment in the family affects the child. When the child is born, the upbringing is also very important. And the past karma, we believe in incarnations, have the effect. Based on that, when you are born, the time, the place, the planets work on you. There are nine planets. But it doesn't mean that you cannot make your destiny. God has given you wisdom. That wisdom is to be used to balance all what is going wrong and make it up and have confidence in yourself. Once you have confidence, things work. So, so GP, uh, if I can ask you, given, given the success you've had, uh, I don't embarrass you, but clearly a huge amount of success over your business career, and now you're running this incredibly large and successful organization. What continues to inspire you? Only work to give. Because I don't believe in retirement. I don't believe, although my children, grandchildren, they tell me you're 80, that you should retire now, take easy. I say, no, I'm not working for myself. I'm working to generate, to give away. Today you take any institutions, whether it is in UK, USA, Europe, Africa, even in climate change, we have been the first one in Monaco with Prince Albert Climate Change Committee. Uh, so going back, what is inspiring me is to keep on working till the end of my life. And that also not for myself to give away. At the time of COVID-19, one hospital of the wing, we said it's only meant for COVID-19 people to see what best we can do. Feeding the poor people went automatically. And God helps at that time. My daughter helped, she in 22 states, in African countries, even in UK, wherever we found any need was there. Uh, we supported the Imperial College, we supported many different institutions who were trying to either develop a vaccine or trying to see what best they could do. So, I don't know, Andy, uh, maybe we are totally different to the rest of the business house. But three stories, 
as part of our extended family. We have never treated them. And you'll be surprised. I have people with me working for last 50 years, 45 years, 40 years. I never asked them to retire because they have been the pillars of the organization and they have within themselves the culture and the knowledge of the family. I know if you go in a professionalized organization, age 60, retirement, 65. Although the individual may have stamina and strength to work, but he has to retire. Now, these are all different things. I don't know in Warwick if you have any such uh, education to be given to the students that they should never think of retirement. They should always see retirement is only once when you are gone from the world. And indeed, you yourself are an entrepreneur. Yourself. I am told that from the first 50 on technology, you are one of them. You are entrepreneur from the top 100 in the world. So it's very difficult for me to deal with you or answer your questions. But I'm just giving you from my experience what I have. <laughs> no, no, GP, thank you, man. And I, um, I think that the, the, that sense of purpose as someone who's taught entrepreneurship and has spent a lot of time researching uh, the behavior of entrepreneurs, that sense of purpose is really, really important to them. A lot of people misunderstand entrepreneurs as first and foremost being motivated by money. And actually, the vast majority of entrepreneurs uh, I, I speak to are those which are motivated not by money. Money, money may follow, but it isn't the primary motivation. They want to do interesting things. They want to do things for non-pecuniary reasons. And so I think uh, your story there is, is absolutely fascinating and, and, and very, very moving. I'm, I'm, just going to, I'm just conscious of time. We've had some inter really interesting questions. I don't want to hog all the questions as well, because clearly I, I, I have the good fortune of being able to ask you questions directly, but there's some questions from some of the audience. Um, one, one interesting question I'll is that... Them. I'll welcome them. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, is can you recommend um, a book, that, uh, a, a book which is for, for people to read that has changed your life and had a big impact on you? Uh, will you please repeat? So can you recommend a book that is something which has changed your life? Any, any particular book you've read where you've thought, this has really changed my interpretation of the world made me reflect or in, in, in any way? Let me tell you, I never had time to read many books. I am a bottom line person. I start with the beginning. I go to the center and to the end. And the book which really helped me was of Vivekananda where he said, destiny is in your hand. And don't think that your luck is good or bad. But it is up to you, your courage, your confidence, your sincerity, loyalty, commitment. That book is interesting, but more than that, now I am writing three books, they are ready. One is a coffee table book of our family, which I was to launch two months back, but I'm holding it. It gives the history with the pictorial sheets. The second one is blessings. In this blessings, I am very much affected. One day I was on the bank of river and certain thoughts came to me that why good and bad is happening. Why one is intelligent, one is not having the wisdom. So what I will do, I will send you few of these blessings books. And from there, I have now completed the second blessing book because the first one, was very much appreciated by my friends, family. 
they have been keeping it in their prayer rooms also. And the third one is the most difficult one. I am worried that some may even hate me. I am saying all religions are man-made. Whether it is Christianity, whether it is Hinduism, whether it is Buddhism, Jainism, Sikhism, Chinese, anything what you take, the bottom line and the end of that is what? Love and truth has to be there. The God is same, but different prophets came in and they started making their own story. Now, my objective is to see that book is ready, that how the launching has to take place. I'm in the getting endorsed from the head of Islamic, but then I'm in difficulty. Today, who's head of Islam? Can you tell me, Andy? Can you help me? <laughs> I can't help you on that one. <laughs> okay. Okay. If I have to go to the head of Hinduism, Hinduism is not a religion. Sanatan Dharma is the religion. Hinduism is the tradition and culture. Similarly, if you go on each and every religion into the depth, huh, I find myself in difficulty, but the book is completed. I also approached Archbishop of Canterbury for an endorsement and the Minister of Multi-Faith. I remember in 2000, when Tony Blair was the Prime Minister, we were the first one to start uh, on this multicultural faiths. And I remember we contributed six million pounds to have it an Olympic uh, presentation of it, along with the paintings of all religions and saints. And then I found the heads of some religions came to us and to the prime minister that this is wrong. It should be done by everyone. Why only the Hindujas should contribute? So I said, God bless you. All of you come in. So I got further five million pounds. I saved five million and it went. So in this way, things keep on happening. But the book which inspired me was of Vivekananda, where I got confidence on the destiny. And second is all these books now I start, but I don't get time to complete them. Even if I have to write my memoirs, my children tell me, hmm, I don't get time. Time is the only thing which we cannot buy. <laughs> how, how true that is. I'm just conscious of time. So I would like to ask one last question, if I may, uh, GP, Please. which is, uh, if you had one piece of advice for the UK government uh, on promoting entrepreneurial spirit amongst our, um, amongst our younger people, what would it be? Very good question. Oh, it's a question from the audience. Yeah, you're the boss of entrepreneurship. <laughs> <laughs> you are asking from someone who is uneducated, but well, from my experience, yes. if, I, if I understood well, your question is what the British government should do yes. to develop more entrepreneurship. Am yes. I That's right. Okay. What them should have? curriculum. How much is he educated? He's from Warwick University. He's from Oxford. He's from Cambridge. No. You have to look at the talent of the person. And I have found many talented people who are not even well educated, but their delivery and their result is much better. So for that, 
the British government should come up with some encouragement. Now, I was selected last week in the advisory committee of Indo-UK bilateral. What should be done? Because the prime minister was going. I wrote down three pages and I said, look, India and UK can become the best partners in the world because there is so much commonality. If you look at the law, if you look at the culture, British people understand an Indian culture, Indian understand British culture. And there is so much of technologies. There is so much of talent in India. So it is reciprocity which is helping. But what is really killing, if you don't mind, I will tell you is bureaucracy. But again, bureaucracy is also supporting and helping. When you don't have good politicians running the country, bureaucracy is helping to protect the country. So all these things are there, but your question is very good. Your audience question is excellent. There should be an encouragement and inspiration for, from the government for entrepreneurs, which today it's not there. Well, GP, I, I, all I can say is that your, uh, your story yourself and what you've told us this morning I'm sure will inspire all those on the call as a call to arms to, to become more entrepreneurial because I, I entirely agree. I think talent is distributed and it's the important thing is, is trying to empower as many people as possible to make the most of their talents. But I can only tell you, I was in a school, five or six grades classes I did. And then my father had a, school and college and they said oh why your sons are going to different school if your school is good why don't they come there so i had to leave that school i went to that school and then my good or bad habit was whenever the homework used to be given on the blackboard by the time the professor or teacher they used to write I used to complete the answers on the notebook and leave the class by handing over the answers to the teacher. I never used to keep anything pending. And then when the results used to come, oh my dear, all my class friends and the one who were second and third, they say, oh, he is the owner of the school. He is the owner of the college. That's why he's standing number one. So what should I reply to them? And when the university exams came, there I told my friends that, look, this is not my father's university. What do you expect? And they were surprised to see me in distinctions. But I never used to read. Whenever I went in the schools, college, or exams, I just used to write what came to me. So we should entrepreneurship is very important and we should see maximum encouragement should be given even in Warwick University you should see what students are entrepreneurs have a separate class for them give them encouragement and if they really want an opening in my group I will be happy to introduce them to my HR team okay thank you GP and I think um, uh, your words are very well received and it's a awful lot of university work and attention goes on this issue so it's, it's we will completely agree with you about the importance of encouraging our students to be as entrepreneurial as possible so all i can say today gp is thank you so much again for your time uh it's been absolutely fascinating hearing about your experiences uh the family the family business and i know the audience will have found your words uh, equally inspiring to uh, the, how i found them I'd like to now bring the conversation to a close, but also look forward to meeting you again in the future when, uh, as the pandemic restrictions, as they're, as they're uh, reduced and will allow us. It'll be a pleasure and honor for me to invite all of you physically. Fortunately, we also went into a new area of developing Carlton House Terrace, which used to be the palace before Buckingham Palace, where I learned 
with my son and my brother how to develop historical buildings. And now we are doing old war office where Prime Minister Churchill, they did the World War I, World War II from there. And I'm converting that place into peace and solace and to see how love is created there. Mm. And next year in summer, I have the very big courtyard. I will invite all of you with your students. Oh, that would be fantastic. So thank you so much for your kind invitation. Uh, but before I close, I just want to highlight our next event, if I may, GP, just to steal two seconds of your time, um, which is the pathway to recovery, the role of the International Monetary Fund in establishing growth in the post-COVID-19 pandemic era, which mm. will feature Mahmoud Mohaldin, the Executive Director of the International Monetary Fund, and also Kevin Wall, alumnus of the University, retired CEO of Barclays Bank Ireland, and that will be on the 11th of May. So please do look out for your invitation. Definitely. It will be my pleasure, and I will attend. Thank and you. And also, to all of you out there, please keep up to date with our other upcoming events and opportunities to stay in touch. Please connect with us on LinkedIn, Facebook, and usual social media channels. It's so important you do so to make the most of these opportunities. But so. I will conclude by saying, GP, thank you so much again for giving us your time this morning and, and for all of us benefiting from your wisdom. And I wish you a very good day and look forward to meeting, meeting you in the near future.